Hello, everyone, and welcome to our Digital Days. My name is Markus Eberle, and I will moderate this presentation today. We are very pleased that you took your time to participate in our virtual conference today. The topic of this presentation is security in IIoT or industrial IoT applications. Our speakers are Aditya Madanahalli and Stefan Messing, who are working as software development engineer and business development engineer. Before we start our presentation, I would like to point out one thing. You will be muted during this webinar today. That means that you cannot ask us questions via your microphone. Nevertheless, you have the opportunity to ask us questions via the chat function or the question function in the webinar control panel. Yeah, we will uh, answer your question in a little Q&A session at the end. We have scheduled for this also five to 10 minutes. The presentation will take about 30 minutes and yeah, after that, we will go into your questions. If we are unable to answer all your questions within this time, we will answer them via mail afterwards. And always, if you have any other questions, just email us at exhibition at we-online.com. At the end of the presentation, you will be also asked to participate in a feedback survey. Of course, we would be pleased if you take your time to fill out the quick survey and help us to improve our digital days. At, and also you will receive the link to the presentation in the next few days and also the recording, we will upload that on our website shortly. So yeah, now I will hand over to our speakers and I wish you an exciting presentation. Perfect, thank you, Marcus. And thanks for the quick introduction. Uh, welcome everybody to our web webinar today um, with the topic security in IIoT application. Um, we prepared a little agenda for you guys, um, talking in the first part about why security in IIoT applications uh, in general. We talk a little bit about the complexity in building a secure IIoT system. Um, we talk about current IoT security standards in general, and then moving on to more um, detailed um, explanation on what's uh, available actually right now. We will show uh, some embedded security requirements, um, show an example for secure embedded IoT design, and then, like Marcus mentioned before, we move over to your questions. So please, whenever you have a question, write it down, write it in the chat, and we will come back um, right after it. All right. So a warm welcome from my side as well. Um, let us begin then with a question, Stefan. Um, why is security more so important with respect to any IoT application and specifically with respect to industrial IoT applications? Yeah, to answer this question, I highlighted two slides uh, from, from the guys from IoT Analytics. On the left-hand side, you can clearly see um, the global number of connected IoT devices uh, spanning in a range from 2015 all the way to 2025. Um, right now, beginning of 2022, we, we are between 12 and 13 billion devices, and you can see clearly until the end of 2025, uh, they are talking about almost 22 billion devices. And I've even seen stranger or higher numbers going up to 50 billion devices or even 100 billion devices. Um, it doesn't really matter how, how much, uh, it's just showing this number is just huge. And when we compare the right side, um, the second uh, picture on the right side, uh, talking about the IoT security market, you can see uh, a similar graph. Um, it, it's not going to 2025, but still you can see uh, the trend is showing up. And, and this is just huge. And if you compare the growing rate uh, from the security market, um, showing 44%, compared to the number of connected devices on the other side, showing 17%, you can see uh, you can clearly see the security market is growing way faster than all the security, uh, all the connected devices, which is good and which shows a clear trend. Okay, that's interesting. We see there is a big potential, but what do our customers think? What do customers in general think about IIoT security? Yeah. For customers, you can you can find clearly lots of different answers. Um, we made lots of surveys already. Uh, in this uh, slide, I chose a um, a, a trend. Uh, 
um, a questionnaire Farnell did. And um, so the question is, what is your key concern regarding IoT implementation? So this is uh, something directed towards implementation of any IoT application. So what do you have to answer here? So when, when I would think about this question, I would maybe go to, yeah, the most important thing about IoT implementation, maybe connectivity or how sensors and modules work together. But then you see um, clearly in the answers, security uh, first place, 36% um, of all the people ask, um, that's a very clear answer, security, super important for the IoT impl implementation. So another question that typically comes up is, what is the most important aspect to consider when developing an IoT solution? This is more or less oriented towards developers. I think we have a few developers in our audience as well. So maybe they can make a test, but... I mean, my, when I did my guess, I was more about like, I mean, in the end, it's an IoT solution. So I would think about how to use the data or what, what, what happens with the data in the end, the analysis, or maybe even some AI implementation. But again, here, same same thing. First place, um, security. Almost one third of all the people asked um, answered on first place. Security is the most important aspect to consider when developing IoT solution. So, I mean, this clearly shows that IoT security is of primary concern everywhere. And maybe you can throw light on uh, what are the impacts of having or not having rather a proper secure system. Yeah, not, not having a proper secure system clearly shows uh, some possible losses, and those can be potentially huge. And I'm just going through them from top to bottom. I mean, you can talk about rep reputational uh, damages. Um, your customers here, there is a leak. I mean, you have to work years to build up trust with your customers, and within seconds, you can just lose this trust. Um, you can have theft, you can have financial losses even. Um, Maybe they even put you out of business afterwards, just depending on how huge the break is. You can have penalties when not implementing um, correctly or, not, or um, not when you're not compliant with um, whatever um, regular or regulations you have right now. And then also you can have all the below surface costs where you have no idea what they might be right now, but they're coming afterwards. Um, so in, in general, to, uh, to summarize the whole thing, they can be potentially huge when you're not really thinking about security and possible threats they might come with. So the stakes are really large. They are super large, yeah. Interesting. So just to, just to give an example also about, um, about security and I, IoT solutions, um, probably one of the, if not the most uh, famous example for a breach we had a couple of years back where hackers were actually um, um, exploiting a casino uh, and they could even steal some database um, from the network. And they were not just hacking into the network, they were just using a, a, a smart thermometer, which was actually placed in a, in a fishing tank. So they, can, they could get into the sensor, which uh, obviously wasn't secure very well. They could get through the sensor into the network, uh, into the database, and they could pull all the data out of there and, and publish into the cloud. So here you can clearly see it's a it's a huge system, it's a complex system, and um, the whole system is just as secure as the, as the weakest link actually in this yeah, whole that's, thing. Yeah, that's, that's really uh, the, the things highlighted here. Nothing is really safe. And like we said, the takeaway from this is basically your system is as strong as its weakest link. So. Yeah, exactly. When you talk about complexity, um, just a slide to show how complex it can actually get. You have always different levels, you have different layers, um, you have hardware, you have software, you have um, cloud, you have all the links in between and all the time there can be any links in between. Just talking about maybe just picking one out, communication, um, you have to think about technology, the 2G, 2G, 3G, LTE, Wi-Fi, Bluetooth, whatever your connection is. And then you always have to trust, is it secure enough, is the communication set well? Um, or do you have any other problems in here? So the, uh, what, uh, as far as I see, it's uh, usually when you're developing a system, you, you work in a specific domain. So you do hardware design or you do software architecture or cloud architecture, but IoT application encompasses all these different domains. So whenever you see two or three domains in overlapping each other, or whenever there needs to be an interface between them, so that you have 
an area or surface of attack that is possible. So the complexity of IoT is basically because you have to have a wide domain, a uh, wide range of domains and experts there, and somehow there needs to be interaction between these domains. So this is where the, the system, uh, the, the, the system complexity comes into picture. And just, yeah, just adding here to the whole complexity, um, two more slides from, from the IoT analytics guys showing on the left side, just some typical types of breaches where you can have, and uh, like we mentioned before, so you have hardware breaches, you have software breaches, it goes all the way down. Sometimes you even have breaches where you're even after weeks or months, you have still no idea how they got in, um, but a lot um, of different things to take care of and to keep in mind for the whole system. So the question is, okay, now we have uh, seen that the IoT security is really complex and the, the implications can be really huge. Uh, what have we done against these threats? Or what have we done to improve the protection? So um, to answer this question, the first line of defense, which is usually is, I mean, uh, system design and so on, this is done technically, but on the other hand, there are regulations. So I think uh, we need to talk a little bit about IoT regulation landscape. Now, so as you can see, there are efforts worldwide, basically lasting from Australia to the United States, China, Japan, all over the world. Governments are coming up with new regulations. Uh, so these are basically laws to govern, or in order, in this case, protect uh, the the people against these kind of security breaches or security attacks. So um, as you as you can see, more most of the times these uh, these are done by governments. So they are not really uh, the experts or the people who actually uh, deal with the security of devices, so they can only deal in the range of baseline requirements. So these are basic minimum requirements to make a device reasonably secure. So uh, it is anybody's guess to um, see how what is uh, to define reasonably, but uh, you need to start from somewhere. So, uh, the, so here the focus is on uh, uh, ensuring that there is reasonable uh, ways to declare vulnerabilities so that uh, it, more number of people are aware of these things and these things can be fixed by system designers. Furthermore, the focus is on consumer IoT. So uh, most of the time, the industrial, the, the medical, the defense and so on, they have their own standards. So there are military standards, there are medical standards that take care of security. So uh, governments don't usually go into these industrial subsectors. So there are most of the times it is consumer IoT. And the focus is to ensure that uh, the responsibility of uh, the whole system security lies on the device manufacturers. So uh, here, the aim of these regulations in general is to protect the consumers. And the focus here is privacy and data protection, which is uh, is one of one of the most important uh, focus areas for all these regulations. Yeah, what I take from this slide is. It's super interesting. The people who make the laws are not the people implementing um, the whole system. So that's uh, just to keep in mind. And um, so we, we saw a lot of um, talk about a global worldwide view, more on yeah, pretty general topics. Can you go a little bit more in specifics maybe and, and come back to maybe Europe um, in a little more details? So let's look into the ETSI uh, EN303645 standards. This is the cybersecurity uh, for consumer Internet of Things baseline requirements, uh, the norm from, from the European Telecommunication Standards Institute. So this is again, like I said, baseline security requirements to prevent large scale commonly occurring attacks in consumer IoT devices. Uh, so the aim of this whole uh, standard is to uplift baseline security requirements for common household devices, like for example, you, nowadays you have smart lighting systems, smart thermostats, bulbs, and so on. So there are hundreds of devices that are already in everyday life uh, of a common human, uh, common uh, man, and then uh, the aim is to here protect the common man against uh, potential vulnerabilities. Uh, the focus is on constrained devices and connected devices. So when we talk about IoT, it is always connected and uh, constrained in this case basically means that the devices are we are talking about are limited because of their small size or or uh, they have uh, they are battery operated and are limited by processing power limited bandwidth and so on so then we are talking about embedded devices basically 
And uh, this uh, norm specifies 13 different security provisions, including five really specific to data protection and privacy. So like, like I said here, again, data protection is in the focus. And we have also have a test specification document along with the norm so that the test uh, agencies can test devices against these test cases to uh, uh, confirm the, uh, the conformity to the standards. And uh, it's important to note that this is not a, harmoniz a harmonizable standard. So this is not going to be harmonized. Uh, this is the, these are like basic features of this particular norm. I mean, you briefly mentioned those 13 security provisions here. Do you have some, some more details on those maybe? Uh, sure. I don't want to go into details of every specific uh, mm. norm, which is going to be a little bit too much for this session. Uh, I have categorized this into three different categories, software, hardware, and policies. We always talk about hardware and software design, and, and there are basically, uh, these are like, like golden rules of security. Do not use a default password. So this is also already specified as the first norm in this standard. Then you need to ensure that all the personal details and sensitive data is stored securely. You validate input data and so on. What is also important is hardware plays a very important role in security. So you need to have, um, you need to be able to secure the integrity of software with a proper hardware, the insured software security is here. So you need to minimize the exposed area of attacks and so on. What is also important is how do we deal with the whole uh, ecosystem? So this, this would lead us to the policies. So you need to keep, make sure that your, your software is updatable on the device and uh, basic uh, things like uh, you should be able to uh, clearly explain to the user what we do with the user data, what kind of information is stored, where it is stored and how to delete it in there. So these are basically, uh, the whole uh, requirement part of or, or the norms that are specified in the HC standard. Okay, perfect. And moving maybe a little from the theory back to practical. Sure. Let us consider an example. We have a small uh, uh, picture here depicting a smart lock. So this is there everywhere today. I mean, uh, you can buy it off Amazon for for nothing basically. So uh, what, I mean, in, in this in this situation, we consider a door with a smart lock which can be closed or opened using a smart device, which is authorized to do the same. So you have a Bluetooth link connecting uh, the, do the door lock to your uh, smart device, and you have a Wi-Fi link, which connects the, uh, the device to the cloud via Wi-Fi. This is basically the home router. And uh, the intention here is to have lock and other data logged into the cloud. What we see here already is, the size of the device is relatively small, it's battery operated and limited in processing power. Now with this example, we need to consider uh, uh, and, and see how we can provide a security design for this. So this is like I said earlier, like we do hardware and software design, it is really important to consider security right from the beginning and create a concept for the same. And um, considering security design, as you can see, it is always a compromise. So there is no device is secure as, as we showed earlier. So it is only as secure as the amount of effort we put into it. So when you're considering, for example, a smart lock, maybe we'll be somewhere here in the middle where you need to be able to deal with lightweight hardware attacks and software attacks, but may not be advanced attacks where you really need advanced equipment. So the cost here not only indicates the cost of implementing security, but it is also directly proportional to the cost that a hacker would need or time that a hacker would need to crack the system. So this is always, there is always a trade-off and uh, this is, for example, really clearly mentioned in this uh, yeah, example. So I guess there is lots of ways to protect the system. Is there maybe a systematic way to protect against those threats? Sure, I mean, in this case, when we speak about threat, uh, threat, we have to consider threat modeling and security analysis. So this is a typical uh, way in which we can, you know, bring in the whole threat uh, as well as uh, the whole security concept into one single picture. So what we need to do is we need to ask ourselves two important questions. Question number one, what do we need to protect? So in this case, for the smart lock example, we have the smart lock ID, device ID, which is very important, needs to be secure, firmware. You have, for example, your biometric data, where, for assuming that the lock uh, supports your fingerprint opening of the door and so on. So there are certain assets that we need to protect. 
and then there are adversaries. So the, the adversaries are the attackers. They are trying to somehow get access to the assets uh, with, of course, malicious intents. So the attackers can be remote attackers. This is typically the most commonly occurring attacks. Basically, you have the software attack or man in the middle attacks, which is oh, typically happens over the network. Then you have attackers who are who have physical access to the device. So this can be, for example, using a debug uh, USB uh, dongle or a debug port or so on. So this is like you need to have physical access uh, to, the, to the device. Then uh, in this, uh, we also need to consider the device specific attacks. So this is uh, for this case, uh, in this case, it will be considered the attacks specific to our smart lock and battery compromise can one of be one of the examples. You somehow try to drain the battery out and then uh, the door is no longer useful. So this is uh, basically a device specific attack and then there are other attacks. So as you can see, there are assets that are that needs to be protected and we are protecting them against certain adversaries basically that is then the whole uh, process so that is basically the first step in the security design is to create a model containing all the assets and all the adversaries moving on then the next step is to create a threat model so basically uh, in this case you have i have considered this particular stride methodology for modeling all the threats. So this is a model developed by Microsoft. Uh, there are other models available. So this is just an example, stride stands for spoofing, tampering, repudiation, information disclosure, denial of service, and elevation of privilege. Basically, each of these threats result, or, uh, uh, result in um, losing of a specific desired property of a system. For example, when you're tampering with the system, we are no longer able to ensure the integrity of the system. Similarly, when there is denial of service, basically you're blocking the resource to be, uh, from being available to legitimate users, which means the system is no longer available. So this is basically uh, a methodology that we use for modeling all the threats that occur in the system. And then for the model, maybe you can give us an example to make it easier to understand. So le let's, let's take an example. So basically what happens is you have uh, you have to ask the following questions. Uh, so the question is, what is being protected? From that, you also need to answer, what are we protecting against? So this is basically uh, asset, this is the adversary or the threat, and what do we want to achieve? So what do we want? To, what is this desirable system property that we want to uh, aim at? And then uh, you come to a conclusion of, about what do we want to uh, achieve uh, or, or how do we achieve this? So the, let, let me give you an example. So let us say you have a few uh, certificates that are necessary. In this case, I have written it as cloud credentials. So these are keys that you need to connect your device to the cloud. So these keys are really uh, under threat from software attacks. So for, for which um, you need to protect these certificates. So basically what happens is anybody who has these certificates can pose as a, uh, a legitimate user and try to send in malicious data into the cloud. So for which, um what happens is then we lose the authenticity of the system so mm -hmm. you, the the user is no longer authentic so in order to achieve this authenticity we need to have secure storage so secure storage is in the end the requirement on the embedded device in order to achieve the authenticity that is necessary mm -hmm. and protect against remote software attacks this is this is one of the examples um in this case i've given you a couple more examples let us uh, go to the last one for example wireless link is really an important asset we need to protect it it is vulnerable or susceptible to net network attacks which is basically man in the middle attacks so what happens typically is in this case you lose the authenticity and the integrity of the system when such an attack happens so what do we do to protect the system against it we need data encryption so this is how we uh, do such a uh, analysis in order to derive at the requirements for such a device so what happened, I mean, this is very basic. Uh, this, is, this is really, really simplified and boiled down. Actually, this is not, uh, I mean, it takes really a long time going through this. I can show you an example in the next slide, maybe. As you can see, just for the firmware, if you do a stride analysis, the table looks somewhat like this. So I would uh, request our listeners to go into the platform security architecture from ARM. That is a really good place to start. They also have a really good example about uh, how to design a security for a concept for, uh, for uh, the smart lock devices, for example. So and, and it is much more detailed than what we can present it in this short session today.
Yeah, maybe we can simplify it even more a little. So, I mean, what I can do today is bring it down to the minimum security requirement for any IIoT device. So basically, to begin even talking about security, we need to consider as embedded de designers that we should have secure production, secure boot. Secure boot basically verifies the image of a firmware before booting it up. And this is really essential to ensure the integrity of the system. And uh, the next point that we need is, of course, secure storage in order to store personal data, keys, and other credentials. Moving on, we also need a secure connection like we uh, saw earlier. So we need a secure connection, uh, encrypted as well as authenticated. Secure root of trust is something which needs to be kept in mind when choosing the device. So we need a device identity which is unique, unclonable, and immutable. So all the cryptographic operations, for example, encryption and everything starts with this unique ID. So we need to make sure that this is really immutable, basically. And finally, uh, in order to keep the software updated, we need a secure firmware over the eight possibility. So these are basic minimum requirement, I would say, for any embedded IoT device. So, and as you have shown all the requirements, the basic minimum requirements, how can we from Worth Electronic help our customers? Of course, I mean, um, yeah, I mean, just to, just to point, go back a little bit. The most important point that needs to be considered is security should be always considered as security by design and not an afterthought. This is something which we need to stress, uh, really stress today. So, uh, and to answer your question regarding how we can help, um, of course, we do not do end devices. We do not produce end devices that directly connect to the internet. But we all already provide wireless connectivity solutions and modules. What we make sure from our side is that we make sure that all our modules are ready and prepared to be uh, to have all the basis requirements that are necessary for a secure IoT application. Let us consider the Calypso Wi-Fi module, for example. So it implements secure boot. It has a secure Wi-Fi connection with WPA3 and TLS 1.2. These are all the state of art uh, security standards. Then you have a hardware accelerated crypto engine to perform cryptographic operations, a secure file system, and so on. So basically, you have all a set. You have a really rich set of features that you would require to build a secure uh, IoT application. Okay, there was Wi-Fi, maybe some example for Bluetooth? Uh, of course, uh, we have a similar idea here with the Protoys 3 Bluetooth Low Energy Module. This is one of the uh, modules that uh, implements Bluetooth Low Energy Secure Connection. This is an end-to-end -end authenticated as well as encrypted Bluetooth connection to your smart device. So we also implement a secure boot, has, uh, and uh, the device itself has a unique non-temperable device ID and so on. And these, again, like I said, we have the device ready uh, or, or the module ready uh, to be uh, implemented into any secure IoT device. Um, maybe I will also uh, like to show you another module example uh, where we have a proprietary wireless module. This is a 2.4 gigahertz module, really small size, good range and so on with a lot of capabilities, but um, we felt that, I mean, in some cases, we, it is not really directly suitable because, first of all, it doesn't have IP connectivity. It doesn't go into the, into the IoT world. So, But in order to make it even more secure and stronger, we have coupled it with a cryptographic coprocessor from Microchip, which adds a host of security features like state-of-the-art encryption, secure boot, secure key storage, and so on. And we coupled these two things, and the result is our IIoT ready wireless connectivity solution called the Thione Featherwing. So this is um, a good basis for any secure end application. Okay, great. And I guess um, while talking about Featherwings, on our last slide, um, we can show our yeah our full line of Featherwings we have so far. Um, the Thione wireless Featherwing, which Adi just um, showed. We have also um, the Wi-Fi uh, option available with the Calypso Wi-Fi Featherwing. Um, then we also have a sensor feathering where we put four of our sensors on top of it and we can uh, or our customer can start right away. And then uh, our fourth featherway, feather wing, um, the magic power feather wing, um, where you can have all the inputs which you need for your application and then everything stacked together. You can just start away. Feather wings are a great way for your IoT application to get started uh, in a quick way, in a, in a really uh, economic way. 
and it's actually the best way to get your IoT project flying. So try it out. out. That was our last page, actually. Um, you can follow the links for more information. Um, you can have all your questions in the chats. Uh, I hope there are a couple of questions now. So, yeah, thank you at first for both of you for your interesting presentation. Yeah, as you've mentioned, now we would like to turn our attention to your questions. And yeah, we already got some questions. So, yeah, just don't, uh, yeah, we will start right in. So, first question, how do you ensure that the module remains secure over a long period of time? Yeah, this is a really a very interesting question. Um, as you can see, uh, there is always this uh, kind of a cat and mouse game happening. So uh, you uh, you come up with a new standard for security and people find ways to hack this particular system. So you come up with a patch to fix this uh, vulnerability or uh, hack, then the, the new uh, vulnerability comes up. So there, there is always this cat and mouse game going on. So in order to ensure that the device remains secure forever, it is really essential that uh, we need to have the updatability or updatable capability built into the system. So software updates really important. Maybe you might have heard, keep, uh, you might have been receiving a lot of updates on your Windows, for example. It, it, Windows comes up with a security update every, I don't know, 15 days or something. And same thing with your Android phone, for example. So this is the best way to ensure that your device remains secure over a long period of time. So software updates, make sure that you have possibility to update your device in the end. And I mean, I guess that was one of the um, of the words we had on almost every page we just show, uh, showed the option to be able to get uh, updates either through air or um, however it works, but um, all the devices need this opportunity. Okay, Thank perfect. Thank you for your explanation. Yeah, then let's just go on with the next question. So what is the meaning of a non-harmonized standard? So basically, um, uh, the, there are European standards which are harmonized. Harmonized basically means that uh, you know it is mandatory for a device to be compliant to this norm. For example, I would uh, refer to the radio equipment directive. So in order to uh, operate any device that has wireless uh, connectivity, so either transmission or reception, uh, if that needs to be operational in Europe, it needs to be compliant with radio equipment directive. Um, specifically, the EN uh, uh, the, 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 the 30364 by standard is not uh, harmonizable. Basically, it, it means that even if you're, uh, it, it is not mandatory first for your device to go through the standardization process, it is not mandatory for operation, but it is like nice to have, basically. And the reason why it is not harmonizable is the fact that it has kind of a uh, generic requirements. For example, you need to. Uh, there is a requirement that says the device needs to be uh, up, uh, needs to be using uh, the latest or state-of-the-art cryptic cryptographic standard. So basically, the state-of-the-art cryptographic standards keeps changing every year. So they cannot say yes or no. So you, whether your device needs that or no, that's that's not uh, easy to say. So basically, uh, this standard is not meant to be harmonized. Then you might ask the question, why do we need to go around with the trouble of uh, certifying my device uh, with respect to these standards? A couple of uh, motivational points from my side might be, you will get an edge over your competitors. So there is some kind of a baseline to say, okay, I have reached this thing. So my device kind of uh, basically meets certain requirements or certain security standards. That is one of the reasons why, you, why we can go ahead and uh, do the certifications for this particular standards. And uh, I mean, in, in, in general, it is good to practice this. Uh, it's, 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 a, it's a best practice uh, for secure IoT devices. So that is basically a little bit about harmonization and standards. Okay, thank you very much, Adi. So yeah, then let's go on. Um, next question is, how can you stop spoofing? Uh, that's that's a good question. So how can we start to stop spoofing? I mean, that is basically a point where we are talking about uh, the authenticity of a device. So spoofing basically occurs when you're not able to create unique identities for your device and able to prove that uh, 
to secure the identities of devices, which is why uh, we come to maybe to the slides before uh, the, the baseline requirements. Uh, I can quickly go back to the slide. So when we come to the basic requirement where, where we say secure root of trust, this is really, really important. In this case, you should ensure that uh, the device has unique, unclonable and immutable um, root of trust. In this case, uh, a unique identifier, basically. And this can be achieved by using uh, public uh, uh, key cryptography or basically uh, how, how you achieve using uh, the, the HTTPS using certificates. So public private key certificates. That is one of the typical ways where you avoid spoofing in, in case of uh, proving your identity. Okay. So yeah, just a hint from my side. So if we can't answer your question now in the live webinar or in the live presentation, we will answer them later on via mail. And you also have always the opportunity to give us your question through mail with, yeah, at uh, exhibition at we-online.com. So yeah, let's go on. Um, next question we've got, uh, do your devices satisfy ETSI security standards and in which way? Uh, basically, like I said, the ETSI security standards in this case are uh, focused towards consumer IoT devices and devices that are uh, their end products and the products that we have, the modules, the wireless modules or the sensors do not directly, uh, uh, I mean, uh, it is not a device by itself. So these are uh, modules that go into the design for any IoT device. So like I uh, pointed out in my presentation, we have devices which are, uh, we have modules which are built with basic security features. Of course, you can build a really secure device, IoT device based on our modules, but the module themselves are not suitable for uh, any of these uh, uh, ETC security uh, certifications. So on the other hand, I can talk a little bit about the radio equipment directive here. Maybe that's that's also really important. So uh, all, all of our devices are uh, usually uh, uh, certified to operate in Europe and the North America. So basically RED, that is uh, the, the CE and also FCC and, and sometimes uh, Industry Canada, RA for Japan and so on. We do these certifications because they are done on a modular basis, so on, on, on the module level. And uh, they can be carried uh, forward and then built into an end device and the end device itself can be, again, needs to be recertified. So that is the process that happens. But as far as uh, the current situation with respect to security, we can only prepare our devices and ensure that our customers have all the necessary features so that they can make their own system and then go ahead with certification with respect to HC standards. So that is a little bit of long, long explanation, but yeah, that's how it is. Yeah, perfect. But I think you also answered our last question for now. What certifications do you need for an IoT device? So. I think that that is also answered. So yeah, then we are finished already with the presentation. So again, Stefan and Adi, thank you very much for your presentation today. It was a pleasure to uh, yeah make it with you. Yeah, Thanks thank you all. Thanks for listening. Yeah. Bye bye. So bye. then I will just give you a short hint for the next topic we have. So we will start at 2 p.m. and we have the next topic is uh, sustainable food production with horticulture LEDs. So yeah, uh, be curious. I hope you stay in and yeah, we see you in the next presentation. So thank you very much and goodbye.